In the entire history of Narnia, no villain is more recognizable, more infamous, and more deadly than the White Witch herself. The Queen of Queens and the Terror of Charn, the Jinn Giant is known as Jadis. Throughout her life, Jadis left a path of desolation and destruction that spanned thousands of years across multiple universes. Today, we'll trace the dark and ancient history of Jadis, discuss how she came to Narnia in the first place, and follow her path throughout Narnian history. Jadis' story runs deep, and there's a lot more than we can cover in one episode, so we'll be breaking this up into two parts. So let's get started. It's time to leave behind the land of shadows and step into a world that's more real than our own. It's time to follow me into the wardrobe. The White Witch. She's one of the very first characters we ever meet in Narnia. Only hours after Lucy enters Narnia for the first time, Mr. Tumnus reveals to Lucy the dark truth of the world in which she finds herself. Tumnus frightfully explains that all of Narnia has been under the rule of the White Witch, who falsely calls herself the Queen of Narnia. Her powerful magic has cast Narnia into an unending winter, always winter in fact, and never Christmas. And thus begins the story of the Pevensey's epic battle to free the kingdom from Jadis' tyrannical reign and restore the throne of Narnia to its rightful place in Caer Paravel. Some may be surprised to learn that Jadis is not originally from Narnia, nor was she from any other country in the world of Narnia. Jadis actually hails from an alternate universe in a land known as Charn, where she was a member of the royal family who reigned over the entire world. Charn was very old, presumably one to five billion years older than our world. We know this because the sun of Charn was very red compared to the yellow sun of our Earth, and because it was so old, it was the home of a highly advanced civilization with a capital city that stretched as far as the eye could see. Filled with temples, palaces, pyramids, great towers, and beautiful works of art, Charn was the wonder of its world, and possibly the wonder of every world. And seated on the throne in this great civilization was the Charn royal family, of which Jadis was a leading member. Jadis was renowned for her beauty, but she was not always the pale, icy white witch most people recognize. Her appearance would change under circumstances we'll discuss later. Jadis was also not human, so to speak. She actually belonged to a species known as the Jinn. In our world, the Jinn are spiritual creatures of Arabian mythology, the same beings we also call genies. And it was rumored that there was giant blood in Jadis' line. Strange, but it wouldn't be hard to believe as Jadis herself was over seven feet tall. Even stranger, the Jinn were said to be descendants of Lilith, the fabled first wife of Adam before he married Eve. Like I said, strange. The Jinn were of course endowed with great magical powers, and Jadis was arguably the most powerful magician in her world. Her thirst for power drove her to study the terrible secrets of dark magic, and in her training she paid a great and terrible price to discover a dark and horrible enchantment, the deplorable word. The word that when uttered would do the unspeakable. It would completely annihilate all biological life in the entire universe, except for the one who uttered it. When Jadis went to war with her sister in a great struggle for the throne of Charn, they both agreed not to use magic. However, Jadis claimed that it was her sister who first broke the treaty. The war for the throne continued to wage on until at the final battle, Jadis chose to deploy the ultimate and most desperate weapon, speaking the deplorable word. In The Magician's Nephew, Jadis tells us about that terrible moment herself. The last great battle, said the queen, raged for three days here in Charn itself. For three days I looked down upon it from this very spot. I did not use my power till the last of my soldiers had fallen, and the accursed woman, my sister, at the head of her rebels, was halfway up those great stairs that led up from the city to the terrace. Then I waited till we were so close that we could see one another's faces. She flashed her horrible wicked eyes upon me and said, Victory! Yes, said I, victory, but not yours. Then I spoke the deplorable word. A moment later, I was the only thing living beneath the sun. As an empress with no subjects to rule over, Jadis decided to cast an enchantment which set her in a suspended, statue-like state, seated alongside the statues of her ancestors, hoping that someday a visitor from another universe would find her, and ringing an enchanted bell would awaken Jadis, and they would find themselves as her unhappy subjects. And so, Jadis remained frozen in time for centuries, 
possibly even millennia, until Diggory Kirk and Polly Plummer stumbled into Charn by way of magic rings in the Earth year 1900. Unable to resist ringing the enchanted bell, Diggory unwittingly awakes Jadis from her ancient slumber, and in short time, Diggory and Polly are forced to take Jadis with them back to the wood between the worlds, and eventually back to England, so that Jadis may conquer and rule new universes beyond Charn. When jumping between universes, we discover something interesting about Jadis. While in the wood between the world, her strength actually escapes her, nearly to the point of death. And perhaps even more interestingly, her complexion also changes, as she appears pale and she looks nearly white. Once on Earth, though, her strength and color quickly return, but her magical abilities have noticeably changed. For instance, in Charn, she was able to destroy a massive metallic gate, all with the simple utterance of a few magic words. However, in England, she tries to use the same spell, but the spell doesn't work, much to her surprise. Still, she has regained her incredible superhuman strength, and within mere hours, she's wreaked havoc on London, physically assaulting people, robbing a jewelry store, evading police, and declaring her intentions to conquer England and annihilate London. Throughout her time on Earth, Jada's maniacal behavior only grows more and more erratic, at times seeming less like an empress and more like a professional wrestler. After stealing a cabbie and riding it like a chariot, she wrenched off the crossbar of a lamppost and nearly murdered a man with it. Diggory and Polly managed to grab Jadis for just enough time to magically transport her out of England and back into the woods between the world. And at the first chance they get, the children whisk the White Witch away into a new world, an unknown world, an empty world. At first, the entire universe appears to be a dark, endless, empty void. But very soon, the voice of a great lion began to sing, and the group realized they were witnessing the creation of a brand new world. They were witnessing the actual creation of Narnia by Aslan himself. Upon seeing the great lion and hearing his magical song of creation, the witch was taken aback. In a futile and panicked attempt, she flung an iron bar from the lamp, which she'd brought with her from England, and hit Aslan square between the eyes. Completely unfazed by this, Aslan continued on creating mountains and trees and animals. Meanwhile, the iron bar had stuck headlong into the fresh ground, and in mere moments it grew into a full-size lamppost complete with burning flame. And so, in her attempt to kill Aslan, the witch marked the spot where 1,000 years later, Aslan would one day open the world and set in motion Jadis' very own death. Having realized her own utter powerlessness against Aslan, Jadis shrieked and ran away, far into the woods. She remained in hiding for several days and mysteriously appeared to Diggory in a faraway garden in the far reaches of the western wild. Even then, her magic must have been growing because she was able to reach the garden even before Diggory and Polly, who had traveled by winged horse in order to travel quickly. The garden, sometimes called Aslan's Garden or the Garden of Youth, was surrounded by high walls and a great golden gate. And on the front of this gate was this inscription, Come in by the gold gates or not at all. Take of my fruit for others or forbear. For those who steal or those who climb my wall shall find their heart's desire and find despair. Of course, Jadis broke the only two rules of the garden. First, by climbing the wall rather than entering through the gates, and even worse, by stealing and eating the fruit of the tree of youth. As promised, Jadis received exactly what she wanted, eternal youth. However, she was also doomed to endure her life of eternal youth in utter despair, never being able to experience true happiness. Jadis also now found the fruit of this tree to be completely repulsive. So repulsive, in fact, that she ran from the garden and fled far into the north. Meanwhile, Diggory had taken a single silver apple from the garden and planted it by the banks of the eastern beginnings of the great river of Narnia. It grew into a large and broad tree filled with silver apples on every branch. This tree became known as the Tree of Protection, and as long as it lived, its fruit would repel Jadis and keep her from entering Narnia. And so for nearly 900 years, Jadis remained in exile, far from Narnia, in the wildlands of the north, an area that would later become known as the Land of Giants. And century after century, she continued to grow stronger in dark magic, becoming an expert in Narnian magic and developing several tools, including a magic wand which would petrify her victims, turning living creatures to something like stone while remaining alive, and a magic potion which would turn snow into any food she wanted, food that was both incredibly delicious and dangerously addictive. 
And so for almost 900 years, Jada spent her time growing in power, rallying an army of followers, and plotting the day she would one day return to conquer Narnia. And finally, in the Narnian year 898, the Tree of Protection died, and Jadis once again returned to Narnia. Well, that's all the time we have for today, but be sure to come back next time as we conclude the second and final part of this series on the life of Jadis. If you want to join us for our next trip into the wardrobe, be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up and leave a comment below. Let us know what we should mention in part two of this series. And be sure to join us next time as we take another journey into the wardrobe.